Hello everybody, welcome back to Five Field Junction and once again I've got another review for you today. <laughs> it has been a little while since I've done a review, but we're finally back. I've got another one for you today. And as we can see, today's model, it's, well, it's a manufacturer that I haven't tried before. Oh, I suppose I have and I haven't because it's Batman. But today's model, as we can see, is from the EFE Rail range. Now the EFE Rail range was um, a range that Batman launched. It's only been, it was only a few years ago now. It hasn't been around for very long. Um, but I think its main purpose really is that most a lot of the models that you see in this range tend to be sort of older models from other manufacturers sometimes or I think something or something like that or maybe I think some of them are supposed to so they're supposed to be brand new um, but uh, maybe they're not the best or whatever I'm not too sure but today's model it is a new tooling. Well, it is, well, it is and it isn't. Um, again, this is something a bit like some of the other models that uh, the EFE rail range contains that Batman have done. Um, obviously, they've done old models from the DJM, I think, era. So you've got the BT Wild Tank, um, the Adams O2. Um, they've done the old um, Helgen Class 35 High Meek. Um, there's a few, quite a few models um, that they've done. But this particular one, it's a uh, new tooling in a sense that it has, it's not the same as the original release uh, of this model, but in some other areas it is, um, it is quite similar. When Backman announced uh, their, I think it was their winter announcements, it was either their winter or spring announcements for this year, they announced um, this and it took people by surprise, including me. I was very, very surprised uh, to see this uh, come up and they produced five different liveries. Um, this particular one is in the GWR green, um, as you've already seen in the title, um, and it's a weathered version as well. They've also done a weathered regional railways version. They've done the Valley Lines livery, and they've done uh, they've also done the uh, new newer style Arriva livery, although it's obviously Transport for Wales now. Um, but they did the later version of the Arriva livery, and then they also did another one as well. I think it might have been the Met York Metro livery, something like that. I can't quite remember, it's something like that, but yeah, there's five different variations they produced. I think they might have all sold out by now, I'm not too sure. I know this particular version, the, G the GWR Green version, may be very hard to get hold of, um, and the Areva one uh, might be quite hard to get hold of as well. Um, but there might still be a few versions floating about somewhere, but getting hold of some of them, especially this particular one, the, the GWR Green one, you may have a hard time getting it. Um, I was supposed to review this a long time ago because obviously it's been a little while now since this came out. I think it's probably getting on two months now at least, or at the most, something like that. And I've had it sat at the side of the layout um, underneath in its box, waiting to be reviewed. And I've been telling myself I need to do it, I need to get around to it, I really need to review it. Um, but it's never got around to it, so it's been sat waiting and waiting and waiting. Because I did pre-order this uh, when they first announced it, and I did get mine pretty much as soon as they came out. But I've only just got around to reviewing it now, so yeah, well done me. Taking a bit longer than it should have done, but we're finally here anyway. So the packaging from EFE Rail, it's not too bad. It uh, feels quite sturdy. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's going to... It feels like it's going to package the loco very well. Um, also, well, or, but to us, there's not really much interesting stuff on the box. Because it's quite plain packaging, to be honest. But if we have, have a look at the end of the box here, we get, we'll get get a bit of a better sense of what we've got inside. So the model code is e e eight three zero two seven. It's a class one four three pacer. This particular one is number one four three six one one. GWR green weathered, and it's got a next eighteen DCC sockets. And obviously, it's a Batman product. Technically, the EFE rail range is just a range uh, from Batman. On the back of the box, yeah, not really much uh, other interesting stuff there. To be honest, just a bit about EFE rail and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, not too much interesting stuff to be honest. But anyway, if we open up the box, we'll have a look inside. It's just uh, the typical sort of lid style packaging here. So if we just lift the lid up, take that off, there we go. Now I haven't had the box open yet. Uh, when I say that, I have and I haven't. I have opened it and I've had a look through these instructions, but I haven't actually looked at the model itself. So <laughs> despite having it for so long, I still really don't really know what the model's like. So <laughs> we're both gonna get uh, uh, all of us, uh, including me, are going to get a nice uh, sort of first-hand experience of what the model is actually like. I have seen videos and photos of it online, but I haven't experienced it in the flesh yet, so this would be quite nice. So first things first, we've got the instructions here. 
Now, again, going back to the scepticism about this model, it's obviously real track worthy first ones to produce this model. And we're not entirely sure. I think it, I don't know if it was actually ever actually cleared up if if the rail actually had permission um, to produce this model because it is the I'm pretty sure it is the real track tooling. But then Backman have just uh, modified it modify it slightly so to make it easier to DCC fit the, the model and a few other changes here and there. Now, obviously, well, none of you are really going to know, but I did actually have um, a real track pacer. For a short amount of time, I managed to get um, one of the first Great Western local lines uh, liveried ones, and I was um, in the middle of filming a review for it. So this was uh, quite a little while ago now. I think it might have been sometime last year, and I filmed the review. I filmed all the details and everything. However, I came to do the performance test, and nothing. The model would not move. I tried programming the decoder in it because it had it was a DCC fitting model. The decoder. I think, well, I'm not actually ever sure, and to us, I'm not actually sure whether the decoder was the issue or the motor was the issue, but the model would not move. Um, programming it was a bit of hit and miss. I managed to get the lights working at some point, but it doesn't matter what I did, I could not get the model working, and I decided in the end just to send it back and get a refund because I just couldn't be bothered trying to fix it, whatever was wrong with it. So I have a small bit of experience with the real track pacer in terms of what it's like. Uh, what it looks like, the details and everything. But in terms of running, I don't know what they run like because I never actually got to run mine because it didn't work. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure um, if Batman really did have what uh, were supposed to, uh, to be able to produce this. Um, I'm guessing they were, but at the end of the day, we're still not entirely sure. Um, but the tooling in here is the real track, real track tooling. But again, it's just been slightly modified. Um, so I think mainly just probably with the electrics and stuff like that. So the details are probably going to be the same as the real track version. But apart from that, I think the inside might be a bit different. But anyway, instructions. Let's get on to these. So we've got welcome. Thank you for purchasing this EFE Rail Class 143 slash 144 Pacer. A lot of care was taken reducing your model and we hope you enjoy it for many years to come. Well, I hope so. It better last for a very long time. Otherwise, I'm not going to be too happy about that. Considering the price of these, I mean, these were very expensive models, although to be honest, considering how insane some of Batman, Batman's prices are, they weren't actually too bad. The retailer price for this version, the weathered version, I think was £216, which to be honest, yes, it's a lot of money for a relatively small DMU, but to be honest, again, considering some of the Batman's other prices, I mean, take a look at if we can take, um, for, for example, uh, consider their what new 158, um, the newest versions that they brought out, such as the new Reaver one and the Scott Rail one, the prices for that are absolutely insane. Like over four hundred pounds, um, in some cases, I think for sound fitted versions, we're getting close to four hundred pounds for the DTC ready versions. I think. So t considering that, and yet now, I yes, I know the one five eight is a larger DMU, but still, <laughs> to us, I think that still makes this look like a bargain. To be honest, with prices like that. But anyway, enough about prices, need to continue with this. So we've got accessories. Uh, yes, I believe there is probably a detail pack inside running in. Yeah, we'll run the model in for 30 minutes in each direction to make sure it's nicely bed in and lubricated. Uh, lubrication, it would be, would hopefully have been lubricated from the factory. Um, and if you do decide to service this model, obviously it shows you there where to put any lubrication to ensure the model is nicely lubricated. Coupling and uncoupling. So yeah, we've got the electrical coupling between the two units and it does look quite similar to the real track uh, coupling with the pins. So hopefully that uh, will be nice and uh, nice quality and it won't uh, fall apart when we couple all the two units together. Inside, so we've got lighting features. So there's some switches underneath uh, to add uh, some more functionality to the lighting on DC. But obviously I will be fitting a decoder to this. Um, and I'll show you how to do that later on uh, so we can see what it's like on DCC. Uh, DCC and sound fitting. Now, yes, here we go. So this is one of the big differences compared to the real track version. On the real track version, you pretty much have to dismantle the entire motor unit just to get access to the socket because you have to take the body off. You then have to take out the seating, and it was a quite a bit of hassle to do all this because there was all sorts you had to remove, and it was hard to remove it and everything. But with Batman, they retooled it so that you just take out one screw, a bit of the underframe comes off, and then you can just put in the decoder and your speaker. And that's it to us. I think these might even have speaker. I think these might actually have a Shuka Cube speaker factory fitted. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm sure it will tell us. 
but these are much easier to DCC compared to the real track versions. They were so difficult. Oh my god, <laughs> definitely uh, very involved. Uh, what other bits do we have? Warranty. Yeah, we're not really interested in that. So that's all the boring stuff. Ooh, there we are. Okay, yeah, so here we go. So we've got a spare parts list. So this is the dummy car. So it looks like we've got some info there about the underframe. Uh, some more about the underframe. Uh, got parts uh, for the body and the interior. I guess on the next page we'll have uh, the motor units. Uh, yeah, a power car. So yeah, more spare parts. Should you need to replace any, or they you ask, you shouldn't really need to. But again, it does happen. And then nothing on the back. Okay, so we can put those to one side. And now we can finally have a look at the model itself. So if we just lift up this foam, it's a bit awkward to do. There we are. Put that to one side. And there we are, there's the model itself. So we might as well start with the top unit. I'm guessing this would be the most units. Let's lift this out. Ooh. <laughs> Foam stuck to the sides, there we go. Put that to one side. We'll put the box to one side for now because we're not really interested in it for the moment. And here we are. So I'm guessing this is the boat unit. Judging by the weight, um, it feels like it probably is. There is a fair bit of weight to this. So if we just slide off this sleeve, oh, detail bag's fallen off. So what have we got in here? Uh, okay, this looks like uh, some dummy uh, BSI couplers, I think, to go on the ends of the unit, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, I think so. As we can see, as standard, they've got the tension locks fitted. But I'm guessing um, you can fit one of these to either end, and these will obviously look more realistic compared to the tension locks. But obviously, if you're going to run uh, more than one of these together, then obviously it'll be good to have those tension locks fitted. Uh, or obviously, you can change them for whatever couplings you want, because they are in end pockets, I believe. So that's good. I'll just put those to one side. And now we can lift up uh, this flap. Oops, slightly tight. There we go. So if we just take off uh, this plastic. There we are. Lift her up. Oh god, yeah, she is quite heavy. There is a bit of weight to her. There we are. Ooh, get rid of that plastic. And we'll get uh, rid of this as well. There we are. Get all the packaging, packaging to one side. And then we can have a look at the model itself. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> this is, wow, she's stunning to be honest. One thing that I was a bit sceptical of uh, was the weathering because a lot of people have been saying that the weathering on this model, um, especially on, uh, well, from other photos that I've seen of other people that have purchased this model, that the weathering was a bit too much, and especially on the ends. But to be honest, on this one, it's spot on. I have seen photos of other people with these and the ends have been plastered in uh, weathering but on this one it actually looks really really good. There is a tiny bit of weathering on the ends but there's not much to be honest it actually looks really really good. Uh, the sides and the underframe you can see also there is quite a bit it's down there but it's not over the top it's just an ever so slightly light coating of weathering. It really does look good. The interior we can see is still in the original uh, First Great Western uh, blue and uh, pink livery. So that's quite nice. It's quite unique. It's nice that they haven't done a refurbished one. Um, so there was at least one of these did get refurbished with a new interior. And I did, and I was lucky to ride on that one before they retired them. But it's quite nice that on this one they've done it with the original interior. It's just it's something quite unique, I suppose. But anyway, let's have a closer look at the details. We'll start off with the underframe. And overall, it's not too bad. We have seen more complicated underframes on other models, but it doesn't look too bad. We've got the warning signs. We can see all the spring detail there, all the grills, more warning signs, all the piping. The wheels on these things are tiny. They're very, very small. Uh, let's make sure the wheels definitely are driven. Yeah, that's driven. And yeah, that's driven. There is quite a lot of oil on the uh, base there. Um, I'll give that a wipe off before we run her. But at least we know there's definitely going to be plenty of oil in the mechanism, so that's good. We can see there uh, those switches. Um, I can't see any screws though, so I'm guessing the decoder goes in the other unit, which makes sense, I suppose. I put the motor in this unit, um, probably not an awful lot of space for a decoder, so it makes sense to put the decoder into the other unit with all the sockets and all the wiring in there. I suppose this kind of, yeah, makes, bits, makes sense, I suppose, rather than trying to cram all of the motor and mechanism and sockets and everything into both units well into one unit makes sense to use both i suppose so that's quite nice the pickups 
uh, look like they're pretty well aligned. I th is there a, a, two pickups per wheel there? I'm not entirely sure, actually. I can't actually tell. Ah, uh, no, wait, I see. Okay. So the pickups are done by the bearings on the model. So we got uh, the, obviously the power goes into the wheels. It goes into the axles. And we can see just there where the pickups contact the bearings there. And obviously from there, that power is taken to the, it'll go off to the DTC sockets then come back and go into the motor. So that's fair enough. Um, bearing pickups, I'm probably not the biggest fan of them, to be honest. Um, axle point pickups, uh, where they do it just like that with bearings, everything that way, um, I quite like because it's, I think they're more reliable than the wiper style pickups. And I suppose wiper style pickups on this model probably would have been, probably would have been better, I suppose, in a way. But uh, the bearing pickups, as long as they work well, which they should do because it's a pretty uh, decent, uh, nice, strong connection, so they should be fine. Um, but so probably not my most favourite, but as long as they perform well, then I won't complain about it too much. Now the motor, I'm not entirely sure to be honest where the motor actually is. I, to us, I have a feeling somewhere that I saw that there is actually two motors in this unit. There's a motor there which drives that set of wheels. There's another motor there that drives that set of wheels. That's what I think I saw somewhere. Now I could be wrong, but if she is uh, dual motored and it drives both axles in this unit, then fair enough, I suppose, have, trying to put a stanchion mounted motor in this unit, considering how little room there is underneath the seating area, I suppose doing it this way, the way they have done it, kind of makes sense. But then you have got two motors, that's going to draw a fair bit of current, so you want to make sure the decoder can handle that and everything. So a bit of an interesting choice, but well, I suppose, as long, again, as long as it works well, again, I won't complain too much. What's the other end of the model like? Uh, yeah, not too bad. We've got the exhaust there. We've got the C1 uh, clarification, more warning signs. We've got the data panel. We can see the coupling there, and that coupling, yeah, that is exactly like the coupling on the real track model. So they haven't changed that, but I suppose why would they need to? It works. So, <laughs> and again, no complaints really. We can see all the wiring there, though. I suppose probably would be nice if they had hidden that, but then again, putting all plastic down here that will restrict the movement of the coupling. And obviously you want this coupling to, to move quite a bit because obviously this model is designed to go around second radius curves. So, so you want to have a fair bit of movement in the coupling to ensure that it can go around those curves without derailing. But yeah, overall, <laughs> this model is fantastic. Uh, the front looks really, really nice. We can see we got the destination board there, which says X to central. I believe it says Barnstable on the other end, but I'll confirm that so obviously in a moment when we look at the other units. The riveting around the windows looks great. Obviously the lights do work. The lamp iron there, I believe is separately fitted. I believe, yes it is. And then again, we've got the NEM coupling there. A nice uh, NEM pocket with a small slimline tension lock coupler, which to be honest, actually, that's actually quite loose. <laughs> I don't think that's probably the, yeah, that's not probably not the best manufactured coupling. But I don't think it's going to come out very easily. But yeah, that's that's very very loose. So you might want to change that. So to be honest, obviously if yours isn't like this, then obviously that's good. But yeah, <laughs> not probably not the best quality couplings there to be honest. But apart from that, yeah, overall I'm very very happy with her. She feels very very nice. She is again she is quite heavy, which is good. The interior is very very nice, and yeah, we have got interior lighting as well, and we'll get to see that working later. Yeah, overall, which is not too bad. So let's put her to one side and let's have a quick look at the W unit. Okay, so if we just grab the second unit out of the box, and yeah, this is mo very noticeably much lighter compared to the motor unit. So if we just, again, slide off the sleeve, lift this up, get rid of the plastic again. There we are, let's lift her up. Actually, no, <laughs> she actually weighs exactly the same uh, compared to the other units. So maybe there is motors in both units then. I could be wrong though. Ah yes, yeah, looking at the underframes, they are noticeably different. Again, if we just bring the motor unit back into shot, we can see, I think there's definitely a motor there and a motor uh, there, I th there, I think. Um, again, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there is a motor there and there. But as you can see on the other units, there is no motor uh, there or there, because the, uh, as you can see, there's more space there in the underframe. So yeah, definitely just uh, motors in one unit, which is good, that's fine. 
Yeah, we definitely don't need uh, four motors driving this model. That would just be insane. But at least we know. <laughs> yeah, at least uh, the dummy unit, though, uh, is still quite weighty. So I'm guessing maybe this has a die cast uh, chassis. I think, Fe feeling it, um, it might do, but I'm not too sure. It could just be that uh, there's just lots of weight inside the model. But she is, uh, for a dummy unit, she is heavy. Definitely more heavy than a dummy Hornby HST power car, actually, which says something. And the centre of gravity is actually quite low down. It doesn't feel like she's going to tip over very easily. There's, the weight is definitely concentrated in the underframe, which is quite nice. But again, going over the unit, it's just as good as the other unit. The detail is very, very good. The livery application is spot on. The weathering is very, very nice. Again, you've got the interior detail, just as, which is exactly the same, all painted up. Interior lighting, directional lighting. What is the coupling on this model like? Is this better? Uh, no, it's exactly the same. Still very, very loose. So yeah, the coupling's not the best, uh, to be honest. I definitely have seen better. And it is quite an easy thing, really, to get right. So the fact that they've got this not quite right, yeah, kind of says something, to be honest. But again, it's not too bad. You can change them if you wanted to. And they are, again, they are NEM, so that's good. They are quite easily changeable. But yeah, overall, she's great. The coupling, again, this end, yep, seems to be okay. Got a nice flow to it. It's not very stiff. It's not too loose either. Very, very good. But yeah, overall, no really, I can't really complain about her, to be honest. Which is great, apart from the slightly dodgy <laughs> NEM couplings. Overall, at the moment, there's not really anything that I can say neg negatively about this model. It's really, really nice. So I think what we need to do now is put her on the track, give her some power, see if she works first of all, and then we'll get her running in and we'll see what she's like. Okay, so here we are over the layout. So um, again, we're at a slightly different area of the layout today, just so to give you a better view of the model, hopefully, rather than obviously around there where we usually do it. It's a bit crammed around there with stuff at the moment, so I thought we'd do it over here. Um, so again, it's a bit more open so we can see the more be model better. Now she's all coupled up, uh, ready. Now I have to admit, uh, coupling these two units together, it's not the easiest in the world, to be honest. It is a bit fiddly to do. And obviously with how delicate the coupling is, you need to be really, really careful with it. Just take your time, be gentle, and once you do get all the pins lined up, just use a bit of force to put them together. And once they're together, they're definitely not going to come apart. So it's a nice, strong coupling, but obviously be very, very careful with it because obviously you really don't want to damage it because if you do, you have a bit of a headache uh, trying, to, trying to repair it, <laughs> or you might even be in a for, a for an expensive repair bill. But anyway, let's just put her onto the track. Only a few wheels to put on compared to most other DMUs. But anyway, there we go. She's on, I think. <coughs> uh, yeah, she is on, definitely. Yeah, all wheels are on, so that's good. Now, obviously, she is still DC at the moment, so she's going to be run in on DC. So we've got the standard Hornby uh, controller hooked up. So let's just give her some power and see what happens. Oh yes, that's not too bad actually, considering she's brand new and she's never ran before, that's not too bad. Yeah, not too bad to be honest, it's quite smooth obviously, she is a bit noisy, but again that is probably partially due to the, due to the controller that I'm using. But yeah, it's not too bad, what's her slow speed like at the moment? Yeah, that's not too bad actually. Now again, I promise the lights aren't flickering, it's just how the camera is picking them up. I have got the camera set to record in the highest quality that I can, so yeah, not really too sure why they're flickering. I'm guessing it's just the way the camera picks them up. But I promise those lights are perfectly stable, and they're not uh, they're nice and bright as well. Not I wouldn't say too bright. I have seen pe some people saying that the lights inside these are incredibly bright. Now obviously, when she's running at full power, or even when we put her onto DCC and we uh, turn the lights on, the functions then. Obviously, we may then see how bright the lights really are. But at the moment, they seem okay to me. But again, obviously, late when we see them on DCC later, my opinion may change. But at the moment, as she is, uh, she's not too bad. Directional lights do work as well. Let's just see if we can see those. I'll get her going the other way first. Yeah, we can see them. The tail lights are on. They are a bit dim, though. Uh, what about the headlights? 
yeah, they're working as well. And even the destination board lights up as well, I noticed. That's quite nice. I didn't realise that was a feature, so that's very good. So yeah, overall, not too bad. Plenty of lighting functions. She's running pretty well, but she still needs running in. So I'll get her running in now, and then we'll come back. We'll see what she's like on DC. Then we'll put a decoder in her, and we'll test her on DCC. So I'll get her running in, and I'll see you in a moment. Okay, so here we are, so she's finished running in, she's had a good amount of time in each direction and everything seems to be fine, she's all nicely lubricated, all of the pickups and everything are bed in. So now we should hopefully get uh, some of the best performance that we can get from her hopefully. Let's uh, give her a wiggle, let's see what her slow speed is like now. It was pretty good to start with before she was running, but let's see what it's like now. I'll bring her towards the camera. A bit more. She's trying to move. Oh, there we go. I think she was a little bit stuck there on one of the rail joints. Uh, because the wheels on this model are very small, so I think she is quite sensitive to joints in your track. So we'll give, her an, give it another go. And there we are. It's not too bad. I think on a better controller, she would probably be a lot better than this. But again, considering the controller that I use, it's not too bad. Yeah, she does suddenly take off again there. So she's not the best caller in the world, I will say. But actually, she's not too bad. Thought the performance is good. It's smooth, it's consistent. Overall, it's not too bad. A very good mechanism inside this model. Yeah, overall, not too bad. So let's get her running around, we'll get a few shots of her running. And then we'll put a decoder in her. So this is her running at 50% speed. And as you can see, it's not too bad. She does slow down, it seems to slow down a little bit in areas. But again, it, she could just, where, it could just be where she's still fairly new. She still needs a bit more running. But overall, she's not too bad. Yeah, overall, she's okay. I think she does need a bit more running in though. But as she is, she's not too bad. But anyway, let's get her stopped. Let's open her up and let's get her DCC fitted. Okay, so here we are. So she's upside down, as we can see. I have left her couple together. So I don't feel incredibly confident at the moment to uncouple her. I'm pretty sure though it is just the usual pull uh, the two units apart uh, with a bit of force and they should come apart fine um, but I don't want to do it at the moment because she, it's unlikely that I'm going to be taking her off the track and putting her away anywhere for a while so she'll be perfectly fine as she is uh, coupled together. Now to chip this model it is fairly simple I believe it is just the single screw just here just the side, uh, on the other side of this bit of detail here there is a single uh, crosshead screw. So if we just grab a crosshead screw, a screwdriver and if we undo this screw here, there we go, there we are. And then this piece of detail here should just come off. If we grab a flathead screwdriver so we can then put that underneath there. There we are, be nice and careful. There we are, out it comes. And yeah, there we go, inside there, if I just grab the camera for you and show you, hopefully you can see there, hopefully you can see that, there we go, if I get the camera in the right position, there we go, as you can see just there, that is the next 18 blanking plate there, with the switches on it, but obviously, I think it's quite a good idea actually with this, that they've put the switches on the actual blanking plate itself, so I see on analogue, it's nice to have them because it adds a bit of functionality for the people on analog. But obviously on DCC, since the basically the function of these switches is basically replaced with the decoder, you don't need these switches. So it's actually not a bad idea that they've actually put these switches on the uh, blanking plate there. Then hopefully just next to it, I'm not sure if you can see, but it, just inside there, there is a sugar cube speaker just out the way, just underneath there, already fitted to the model. So to fit sound, it's nice and easy. You just need a next 18 uh, pin sound decoder. Um, I'm just going to be fitting a standard decoder for now. 
whether I fit sound um, in the future, I'm not too sure. But obviously I want to run on DTC because that's obviously what I do. So we just need to take out this blacking plate and fit in a next 18 decoder. So I'll just put the camera back there for you. And we'll grab, actually no, we'll take out the blacking plate first. So it'd probably be a bit interesting actually. There's not a lot of room inside here. And um, if we just grab the screwdriver, there we go, prise it out. It should come out fairly easily. Yep, there we go. So that's the Next18 blanking plate out. I think this is one of the good things about Next18 decoders actually, is that they're quite easy to take it, take in and take out, um, because obviously there's not really any solid pins really that uh, get stuck in there quite hard. So it's not quite easy with these. The decoder is a Dapol uh, decoder that I'm going to be using. Uh, Dapol's decoders, they do seem to be uh, really nice decoders. I quite like them. They provide some really good performance and they're also quite reasonably priced as well. So that's why I decided to go for this one. So if we just open the box, there we are. That's the instructions for the decoder. Don't need them for now. And there we are, take out the decoder. Just try and price it out of this foam, there we go. It is a very small decoder, as you can see, very, very small. I'd say to be honest, if I just grab a spare Hornby decoder that I've got, it's even smaller than that. And Hornby's decoders are probably some of the smallest you can get. I'm actually surprised at how small this decoder actually is, especially if you were to say consider or compare this to the new Bluetooth uh, decoders the Hornby have done. The next 18 version of that is massive. Now I know that's a sound decoder. I'm not sure how big the regular next 18 pin decoder that Hornby have done is. I'm not, I'm not sure how big that is, but the sound decoder, I'd say it's probably getting on maybe three to four times bigger than this. So that says something, I think. But anyway, we just grab the decoder. We'll line it up with the socket. It's probably going to be a bit difficult to do this actually, because it's obviously in a bit of a recess. But anyway, try and get it lined up with the socket and then push it in. And there we go. There we are, that's in. Make sure that speaker wire is definitely out of the way. There we go. And if we just pop the cover back on, it might be a bit difficult to do because all this detail, we've got all this detail in the way. Okay, there we are. I finally managed to get the, the bottom section back on. Um, it is actually quite easy to do, but it's just the fact of getting the small lug that you can probably just see there that's attached to this piece of plastic, getting that lined up or just right is, is actually quite uh, important. So if you don't, then the piece just won't go back on. But once you do get it lined up, was actually, which is actually much easier than I thought, I will be honest, I was trying to do it wrong. But once you get it lined up, it's nice and easier to get that back on. Then you just put the screw back in and that's it, job's done. Okay, so here we are. So as we are already aware, the Dakota's now been fitted. She's all been programmed uh, to my liking. So I've given her a new address. I've changed the acceleration, deceleration, start voltage, back EMF, all the usual stuff that I tend to do, just to try and get the model to run um, as well as I can get it to. Um, and she seems to be handling okay. Still a touch jerky at low speeds, but again, she is still quite new, so she again, she made Steve a bit more running, um, but I could uh, fiddle around with the settings for a bit, but for now, she's running um, how I want her to. Uh, so that's that. But anyway, we need to get onto the functions, and there are quite a few of them. Obviously, being a Next18 decoder, I'm pretty sure these decoders are six-function fun six decoders, um, so they can handle quite a bit, so you get quite a bit of control with the lighting and stuff, which is nice. Now, you'd think that Function Zero would activate the uh, directional lighting, but it actually doesn't. Function zero by itself doesn't actually do anything, but what it does seem to do is it almost seems to unlock the rest of the functions if you like. So I find if you try and activate the rest of the lighting functions, which are on basically the rest of the functions like one, two and three and so on, you actually have to have function zero on to allow those functions to work. For example, if I turn function zero off and then activate function two, um, which is the, I'm pretty sure that's the, the directional lighting and the uh, headboards, which also light up. As you can see, it doesn't do anything, but if I then activate uh, function zero, you can see, there we go, the board uh, comes on and the directional lights have come on as well. And if I change direction again, you can see, there we go, the tail lights come on and the destination board goes off. Um, I suppose it probably would be nice if that stayed lit up, but then again, it may not be too, may not be realistic, so, and I'm not too sure, but anyway, yeah, a bit weird why you have to do that. It could just be the way the decoder is set up. I could uh, go in and change uh, the mapping for the functions on the decoder, but I don't know how to do that. So I'll just have to live with this, I suppose, which is fine. 
Uh, function one, I can't actually remember what this does. I don't think it actually does anything. So if I turn function uh, two off, which again is the directional lighting, as you can see there, nothing happens. So yeah, I don't, don't know why the, the uh, mapping for the functions is really strange, but that's that I suppose. And if we turn function two back on, we can see, there we go, we've got the lights back on again. Function three is the interior lighting. So if we put that on, there we are. Now it is a tad bright, I will be honest. It's, I think the camera is making it looking a slightly brighter than it technically is. It is a bit bright, but it's not quite as bad as other photos that I've seen people post online. Um, but yeah, it would be nice if maybe it was a little bit uh, dimmer. I suppose there probably there probably is a setting on the on the decoder that you can change to turn that lighting down. Um, I could be wrong, um, but I suppose being a, it's quite a high quality decoder, and obviously I'm I'm sure there's probably a way you can do it. Obviously, if you wanted to, you could open the model up and rewire it, wire in an extra resistor or something to turn the lighting down. I suppose I'm pretty sure there's a couple of options there that you can do. Um, but as it is. I don't find it too bad. So, yeah, probably a slight, on, slightly on the tad side, so a slight on the bright side, um, but overall it's not too bad. Now, function four uh, does the lighting in the cab area. However, since programming the decoder for some reason, that function is just going mad. It's just gone really glitchy for some reason. It does work, but it now only works in one end, and it just flickers like mad. I don't know why it does it. Um, I seem to find that changing CB54 seems to affect it a bit because when I was changing CB54, which is the back EMF setting, I found that changing that does seem to affect how much the lighting in here flickers. I've currently got, currently got CB54 set to number one and you'll see if I turn function four on, um, I think I need to change direction again. There we go. Look at that. What's it doing that for? When I first put the decoder in and first tested it without changing anything, that was fine, it worked fine on both ends, it didn't do anything at all. But now that I've programmed CV54 to how I want it, this is what I get with the cab lighting. Why is it doing that? That is not right, I don't, and it shouldn't be doing that as well either. Changing a simple CV for the back EMF setting, I don't see why that would affect the cab lighting, but for some reason it is. In the other end it doesn't work at all, and it does that in this end. That's just really, really strange. I haven't done anything to, else to it. I've only changed the regular settings. I haven't changed any CVs that I wouldn't normally change. And for some reason, changing that setting is doing that. That's just not right. What I will quickly, what I'll quickly do actually, is I'll just reset the decoder to the factory settings and we'll try it again and we'll see if it works perfectly again then. So I'll see you in a second. Um, I'll quickly reset the decoder and we'll come back and we'll see if the cab lighting then works as it should. Okay, right, here we are. So the decoder has been reset, and now here we go, watch this. Function zero on, then function four, which is the cab lighting. There we are, working in the other end, and if I change direction again, there we go. You can see it's now working perfectly. So that is really, really strange for some reason. Changing a, a few simple CVs that you would normally change, for some reason just mucks up that function for some reason. So. What I'm going to do now, um, actually, is I'll try, I'll reset um, all of the other CVs that I did normally, but I won't change CV54. I'll leave that as it is, but I'll do the usual address, acceleration, etc. But I'll leave the CV54 as it is, and then we'll come back and we'll see if the lighting still behaves as it should do. Okay, so we're back finally once again. Apologies for all this editing, but I feel some of this stuff is quite important to mention. But anyway, we're back. I've changed the address, I've changed the acceleration and deacceleration, and I've also changed the start voltage. But again, I've left CV54 as it is. And yeah, once again, there we go. As you can see, still working fine, as it should do. So yeah, again, I'm not too sure what this issue is, with the, whether it's a decoder issue, or whether it's just uh, the way the model's been wired for some reason, I'm not too sure. But yeah, that is really, really strange. But anyway, we'll put that issue aside. Let's get the model running and we'll see what performance is like now with her decoder fitted. So if we just, uh, we'll turn that function off for now. Let's put the directional lights back on. We'll put the interior lighting on as well. Change direction, there we go. And let's get her running.
Well, overall, I think you'll agree that this is one fantastic model. She runs incredibly well on DC or analog. The performance is excellent. It's smooth, it's consistent, it's quiet. Batman really have done an amazing job on this. Now I know obviously yes it is technically the real track model with just the odd upgrade here and there. But overall it is fantastic. Oh, she, she does have those odd slight quality issues here and there. For example those NEM couplings on the front and back. They are a bit loose which whilst isn't really that great. Couplings are very easy to get right. And the fact that these are loose as they are isn't really very good to be honest. Getting the bottom uh, panel off and back on again, whilst getting it off is quite easy, but well, it is very easy to be honest. Getting it back on it is a little bit of a headache at times, which isn't really that great. And one thing that I haven't mentioned, and what you haven't really seen much of, because it has mostly happened off camera, is that this model does seem to be very sensitive to gaps in your track. Especially, well, what pretty much 100% if they're on corners. I found if you have a large enough gap in between in between two pieces of track on a corner, this model does seem to be quite prone to derailing on those. And I think that is just mainly down to the size of the wheels. The wheels on this model are quite small, which I suppose is just, it's not really well, an issue with the model itself, it's just sort of by design. The wheels on the paces are quite small anyway. But still, you shouldn't really have a model that derails that easily. Now, I know that my layout probably isn't the best in the world because, again, it's, it's just a temporary layout and the track work probably isn't absolutely 100%. But again, it is on a baseboard. I do try to lay it as best I can for the most part. And no other local I have derails on this layout at all for no reason. So the fact that this one does it is, I suppose, a slight issue. But then again, your layout may be much better, better than mine, so you may not have any derailing issues with it. But apart from that, apart from the very minor, minor issues, this is one fantastic model. It really is great. If you want one, I recommend getting one. It might be quite hard, but if you do get one, I'm sure you'll be impressed. I certainly am. And now let's have some ratings for the new EFE Rail Class 143 Pacer in the GWR livery. Now first of all the detail, I cannot fault it, the detail on this model is just amazing. Lots of detail all over the place, the owner frame looks really really good, the livery has been applied really well, the interior detail is second to none. There are very few models that have interiors that look as good as on this model. Lots of painted detail on the inside, interior lighting, I can't fault it. This the model, that's just the detail on this model, it's just second to none, I cannot fault it. The performance on this model, I just I really did want to give it 10 out of 10 because it runs so well, it's so smooth, it's so quiet, it's consistent. The only reason I've marked it down is because of the derailments that it has on corners. Now I know this potentially is just because of the way the model is. The wheels on it are quite small, so that may set make it that may make it more sensitive to dodgy track work. But still, I have loads of other models. My collection is quite vast and no other loco or units that I have derails on this layout so the fact that this one does does point more to a problem with the model rather than the yeah, rather than the track work now again i know that, that, that this is likely the not a design issue it's just again it's just the way the model is but still you shouldn't have models that derail even on minor gaps in your track none of the gaps that i have between any of my pieces of track are, are really that big there may be small ones here and there but none of them are that large and the fact that this model derails on them so easily I don't think that really does quite show through as a 10 out of 10 performer however apart from that very small issue performance on this model overall I cannot really fault it the quality as well I just cannot fault the quality it's just really really good the model's been put together so well everything looks really good there's no glue marks anywhere none of the paint is blemished anywhere overall it's really really good Again, the only reason it's not 10 out of 10 is just because of a minor issue, and it's because of those very wobbly couplings. Now, couplings are very easy to get right. No other manufacturer that I've seen so far that I've experienced has had couplings that are like this, that are so loose. Now, I know that like these couplings, they're not gonna come out, because they do feel quite sturdy in their socket, 
but they still do wobble about quite a bit. It's like either the socket hasn't been made to the right size or the couplings are just slightly too big. So because of that very minor issue, I have marked it down, but it's not that big. It is only a very minor issue. Your mileage may vary. Your model might not have this. But for my one, the couplings aren't 100%, so I have marked it down, unfortunately. And then lastly, we have the value for money. The value for money overall, I think it's really, really good. I've given it eight out of 10 because of a few reasons. First of all, overall, for what you get, the RRP of still this model is a 200 and something pounds with a price of £216 from the retailers for this particular version and for a, for a brand new model I don't think that's too bad however I still think considering this is quite a small DMU I still feel that the price that Batman charged for this is still a bit too high however it's not too bad I still think considering how what, considering how high a lot of brand new prices are these days I don't think they've priced it too badly however I still feel it is a bit, a bit of a high price for what you get but still, apart from that, you still get, get a really good model, you get really good performance, you get really good detail, the quality is really good. Overall, it's not too bad, but I still feel that this model should have been slightly cheaper. So overall, that is an overall score of 9 out of 10. Overall, a really good score, very well deserving. It's a fantastic model. It's not without its minor issues, but overall, it's really, really good. If you want one, I recommend you get one.